Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to welcome back to the show for his returning, for their returning slot on the show, Rio Lance. Rio, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's an actual, it's an honor to be back on the show. I enjoyed it last time, so I'm excited to see what we get into today. Which is, uh, I think we should just pull the Band-Aid off right now. Uh, you sent an email, I think about two weeks ago, uh, a social media post to me about two weeks ago. And you said, yeah. and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn here, but for personal and political reasons, you've chosen to feel, you feel like your voice would be better fit for federal politics. So for those who don't remember, Rio came on the show earlier in the spring, about June, and they talked about uh, their desire to run in the upcoming 2023 provincial election as an independent candidate. They are now returning to talk to us about the decision to switch from political politics to federal politics. So Rio, let's start off with the, uh, the million dollar question. Why the change? Um, so pretty much for me, I was really starting to think about what I wanted to represent and, and how much I wanted to use my voice. And I had a lot of people around me, and when I see people around me, mostly my um, campaign team. Um, and we just were discussing how, like how I feel with, the, with where I'm going with the provincial level and how I feel with my voice. And then the more conversations we had, the more I just sort of realized that you know what, I feel I'm selling myself short, I guess, per se, and I'm ready to just go for the big dog straight away. And I want to go um, up to a higher level, um, which obviously in this case uh, would be federal, which I honestly, if I'm honest with you, if you would have asked me this three years ago, I probably would have never have thought that I would have been thinking about this for a while. I always did think at some capacity I would go run federal one day potentially, but I never thought it would be this soon. Um, but with so much uh, going on in, in Canada and stuff like that, and just especially when it comes to Indigenous people, I feel we need more voices at a higher level. Although I would love to see more Indigenous levels on provincial level here in Alberta and across all of all of Canada um, in all of their provincial elections, that would be awesome. I do feel that we do need more Indigenous voices uh, federally. I know uh, we've had some in the past, but I just feel that, you know, the, the sad thing is, and, and I've talked about this on Twitter, is, you know, Indigenous people are on track to have equal rights in approximately 475 years. And for me, I feel that's way, way too long. And I feel it's something that we should be thinking about now. And it's something the government should be taking more seriously and not... Um, putting it on the back burner, which I think they are. And I know that they do this on provincial level, but especially on the federal level too. So I think that's sort of how I got here. And, um, you know, I'm just ready to have my voice put at a higher level because that's where I think I belong. And I don't want to sell myself short. I've always been the type of person who, when I go for something, I go really big. Um, like for example, I'm the first member of my entire family to have got my bachelor's last year. I'm about to get my master's and I'm going for my doctoring next year. So over, overall, I'll be the first one in my family to attain all of those different uh, levels of education. And I just feel that on the political level, I feel I belong at a higher level, if that makes sense. It does. And in your first five minute opening statement there, there's a lot to unpack. So let's okay. let, let's go through what you have just said. And I want to start with the conversation you had. You said earlier on in your statement that there was a conversation you had with your campaign team and your campaign uh, workers and volunteers about you, what you were feeling and what you were hearing and what your voice was needed. What was that conversation? Because it's not like a, a Tuesday morning, someone walks up to you and goes, you know what? I think your voice is better federally. Or was it that? It Was it a very quick switch or was it a... 
I want to stick provincially, but like you said, I have the desire to always go bigger and better. So maybe I should start with the big dogs and start federally. Um, I mean, for me, it def- definitely wasn't something that happened right away. It was honestly, it was conversations. Uh, actually, even the last time I was on, these conversations were still occurring, but I really didn't have, it was, I guess it was something, it was, it was brought up really quickly, but it was something that I was really sitting on and really thinking about and, and really just trying to navigate what that looked like. So although it, I will be honest, it did come up quickly to me, it it wasn't something that I could just say yes or no to. Uh, it was something that I was like, you know what, I need to sit on this. I need to, uh, you know, figure out if if this is uh, what I want to do. Because for the last two years, I've, I've obviously been very vocal about going provincial. So I had to really sit on it. Um, so although, yes. So what was the final catalyst? Happen. I apologize for interrupting. But what was the final catalyst that that made the... I'm sitting on it. I'm sitting on it to, you know what, let's do it. What was that catalyst for you? It was probably just, like I said, how I felt, I felt like I was selling myself short maybe. And I felt like maybe I needed to go higher. So that's what it really came down to was I felt I was selling myself short. And because again, even when I was running provincial, when I told people I want to turn provincially, I had people say, you know, why don't you try to, you know, go for, uh, for city, like city level, municipal level, um, or even like school trustees and stuff. And I'm like, no, my voice doesn't belong. I don't feel like I don't want to go that low. I understand the purpose of starting at that level and, you know, maybe working your way up. Um, we know, I mean, we can probably all say there's a lot of people in politics who have started at lower, a lower level of government and, you know, gradually, uh, went to higher levels, but, I think honestly, it was just, yeah, that simply thought as I am selling myself short and I want to go higher. So you said your voice isn't one that you are hearing uh, federally. And that was one of the deciding factors on putting your name for it federally as well. What do you mean by that? What isn't being told on a federal level that you would be able to bring uh, to the House of Commons uh, as a, I'm assuming, independent MP for the province of Alberta? Yes, correct. So it is independent still. Um, I just feel that, you know, uh, any when it comes to Indigenous issues, I've seen, I, I mean, there has been independ- um, Indigenous MPs, sorry, in, in the Liberal Party and the NDP Party in the past. But, um, and although I feel they, they bring up a lot of importance, I, it's, it's not even so much like I don't see my voice. It's, I think if, if more uh, Indigenous voices are involved in politics and more continue to, I guess, scream in the void, because that's kind of how I feel for my um, Indigenous brothers and sisters. I feel a lot of times that when, especially for, for those who do get into politics or into government roles who have a voice, it's still not taken seriously. It's like, why in Canada um, do we have Indigenous communities that do not have access to clean water, um, basic food and basic health care? Like, why is that? Like, this isn't, it's not like we're a third world country, like we're a first world country. So the fact that there's communities out there that still don't have those basic resources to survive is is disheartening and yes I know the liberal government has been trying to bring more clean water to communities and there are there is data for it but it's still the back burner and I don't understand why it's the back burner for for the federal government why it's like okay we're doing it it's almost in from how I feel it's almost as if they're doing it for a photo op or they're doing it to you know uh, like look we're doing this uh we're like you know we're doing this so it, it actually is happening but yet it's not being done fast enough and I don't know why and even the other thing too is I I respect Canada helping other countries. I help I respect Canada, you know, doing what it's doing. But I do feel we need to put more of our money into the people who, like I said, don't have access to just basic things like water and food. Um, even having like access to Advil and Tylenol and stuff like that, which is really easy for a lot of us. 
for a lot of these communities, it's not. And if they can get it, it's like, you know, 40 to $50 a bottle. It's like, we don't pay for it. Like, you know, like in Southern Canada, we don't pay 40 to $50 for a bottle of Advil or Tylenol. So yeah, I think that's, that's where I feel with my voice and why I feel like I, I hope um, by constantly talking about it that somebody will listen like I I just I've always been one of those people like if I will repeat myself a hundred times if I have to but I hope that people are you know taking it and actually you know being serious about it not just like oh we're listening and look what we're doing we're going to show you a graph well the graph doesn't really bring food and water to people so um, that's kind of how I feel on that. You, you you talked about that there was so much going on and you made a, uh, some statements in your last few minutes there about what's going on about clean drinking water, about uh, access to health care. Um, you would be running in a Calgary riding, I'm assuming. Do you, do you mind saying yep. which riding you'd be running in? Yeah, so it's going to be Calgary Minnipur, which is currently held by Stephanie Cuse. And it's, uh, ironically, it's Jason Kenney's old federal riding. So yeah, that's the riding it would be. So it's still South Calgary, which is sort of what I was going to do provincially. So, Okay, so Calgary Minnipur is the riding you've chosen. Um, there, let's be honest, the Conservatives are well known and they're well, well represented in this province. Mm-hmm. Why do you think your voice is needed in 2020 X? And I say X because I don't know when the next of general election is. And I don't think anyone yep. knows until yep. the NDP liberal agreement falls apart or a vote of non-confidence happens in the House of Commons. But let's say in 2025, how do you get these issues on the voices and on the minds of people of Calgary and Minipore, So that way, when you have have the next election you're not just some new independent candidate and you start doing the work now and start having these conversations now so how do you start doing that um i mean i i think just like with my provincial it's uh being honest and transparent and being pretty straightforward i mean the one thing about me is i'm very open to working with anyone so i would honestly be willing to work with the conservatives uh being that it is a rich conservative writing um it means that i have to i guess think more like conservative voters um i mean from from what i've seen i think stephanie hughes got like 71 or 81 percent of the vote last time so uh you know for me and what I've been telling my team is it's not about beating the other parties it's about really stealing half of her votes plus one in order to win uh, that area so I will be honest and say I definitely open to we will be open to um, meeting the conservatives halfway per se uh, on issues that they stand for but at the same time, I'm going to be very transparent and honest and, and let people know uh, when voting for me, these are the different issues that I also stand for because uh, especially like Indigenous issues really are huge for me um, and I want to continue to fight for that. So I think I've always still maintained that same a- um, attitude because that was more of my attitude with um the provincial level as well. I mean, definitely, I don't consider myself a conservative at all. But, you know, I guess it's, it's strategy at this point. But also, it's, I want to be honest. And I want people to know that what they get, what they vote for is what they're going to get. And the one thing too, about being an independent, I want people to know is there's more slack, I guess, on what Uh, I can say because I don't have a party leader telling me what to say or what to do. (laughs) Um, And the other interesting thing is really as an independent, I only have to really get along with the party leaders because it's them who controls how their party uh, votes per se. Uh, I think, I think the greens are the only ones so far I've seen where they've voted a little bit different from each other. Not that there's a lot of them, but I know a, uh, they've been voting differently on certain issues, but as for the other parties, it's really comes down to having maintaining a relationship with 
uh, the party leaders. Um, but yeah, I guess the, the answer would be really just um, being honest up front and transparent, which I've been through uh, with, my with my provincial journey, and I will continue that um, federally. So before we get into some policy questions, I'm going to okay. play a little bit of a devil's advocate, and it's going to come off as someone who is ignorant and a kind of an asshole. So I do apologize right away for this. Yep. You you want to advocate for better uh, better health care, for cleaner drinking water for Indigenous communities. Wouldn't the, I, I don't want to say easy path, but wouldn't the best riding to run in be a riding with a large indigenous population so you could connect with those voters and i mean that with no disrespect and i i i, I don't want to come across as the guy who's being an ass right now and i do apologize if anyone's about to send me emails it's just i guarantee you there's someone out there thinking that same question right now and you will probably have to address that if you're talking about indigenous issues and uh, having the voice of an indigenous person around the table how do you talk about, how do you answer that question? And if you don't want to, I do apologize for even bringing it up. No, honestly, I like that question. Um, I don't think it makes you sound bad or anything. Thank you. Thank um, you for saying that. So that way I don't get the hate now. <laughs> um, I think I think for me, it definitely is something I've thought about. Um, and I don't want to really say uh, if that's the path I'm going to end up switching to. But I think for me, um, I've already maintained relationships with, with some people in, I mean, it was more of the Calgary Fish Creek running provincially. So now it's just expanding out to Calgary Minnapur. I've created some, you know, connections and, and relationships and, and I've, I've talked with people, but um, I definitely agree that it would be, it would be kind of nice to definitely run in a riding that is has a larger indigenous population but for me um if i'm honest i i still i've i'm one of those people i'm still learning about the my culture i'm still learning about the culture so i feel if i was to run in an indigenous rich area even say like none of it or in the Yukon or the Northwest Territories, I just feel that I would be potentially uh, overstepping someone who actually has more knowledge of, of the culture and who has somebody who, who already, you know, lives there, who, who's got the connections there. So it's kind of, it's not that it's, I don't want to say it's a sticky situation, but it's kind of maybe a little bit more complex. So it's not, maybe I'm not answering you fully the way you want, but I just feel no, and that... I, I put you on the spot there. So I do want my listeners and viewers to know that I did put them on the spot there. As anyone knows, I do not prepare questions for this. It's just when you talked about indigenous uh, issues and I, I kept on thinking about that is for like don't get me wrong cal like anyone has the right to run, run wherever they want and i will say that to the day i die you want to run wherever you want go right ahead doesn't bother me it's just for my sake if you want to connect with your voters that's where i was getting at and i didn't i might not have came across that way but i do appreciate you even taking time to answer that yeah no absolutely and like i said it's it is something I've thought about. So it's not like this question, even though it might have been a random question, I actually probably already prepared myself <laughs> for somebody to ask me that. So it was only a matter of time, I guess, that it was. I'm, I'm the band it. I'm the band aid guy. Just rip everything off, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I want to turn to some okay. policy issues now. And that's what okay. I like to talk about. Um, okay. This comes out the week, uh, this is coming out, sorry, September 21st. So for those who are watching this right now, happy September 21st. If you're listening to this later, happy whatever day you're listening to this. <laughs> the next Friday, September 30th, is the second anniversary of the Na National Truth and Reconciliation Day. Um, there have been calls for this to be a federal holiday. This has been uh, calls for it to be provincially uh, provincial holiday. Um, before we get into the holiday aspect of it, what does this day mean to you? So for me, it just, it's a day to reflect on, you know, all of the survivors. Um, 
uh, actually my partner uh, is working for the Orange Shirt Day Society as the executive director as of, he's been doing that since July. So this has become our life the last couple of months. I mean, it was always our life even before he worked for them. Um, for me, being that it has affected both of my grandparents, they were both in um, residential school. Uh, it's a day to really reflect on it um, and um, you know, really hopefully get the message out to people what it means. Uh, what I've been really saying to a lot of people lately is, you know, if all these other organizations can use an entire month to get donations, I've been telling people since actually September 1st to consider donating to the Orange Shirt Day Society. Um, and it's just because I don't want people to just reflect on it for one day. Um, even reflecting on it for one month might seem like it's a short period of time too. Uh, I feel maybe people should reflect on it throughout the whole year, but I understand that we can only start so far so or go so far so I feel if we can really have people think about it for the whole month of September that would be awesome and not just on September 30th um, so for me it's definitely a day for people to just really learn from it and um, you know connect with survivors if they can and learn their stories understand too though that some survivors are on their own journey so some will may not be willing to talk about their stories some will talk about their stories um, like Phyllis Webstadt, who started Orange Shirt Day in 2013. Uh, she definitely tells her story, obvi uh, obviously, when she goes, gets invited to a lot of cities around Canada. And there are other survivors like her who, who will tell their stories. So I think it's really just about learning about it and um, not and just like even researching, you know, I hate to say this, but it's funny to me how a lot of people suddenly don't know how to use Google when it comes to Indigenous <laughs> issues, because there's a lot of people, especially people I know who seem to Google uh, their everything about their health. So uh, not that anyone should do that, but I just find it funny that people can do that. And then when it comes to, you know, residential schools and stuff, suddenly people forget how to use the internet and Google. Google. So, I mean, even researching it, whether it's virtually or, like I said, connecting with people, um, there's there's even YouTube videos that people can watch. Um, so, yeah, that's what the day represents to me. The reason I bring that up is because there have been calls from uh, coast to coast to coast in Canada and from uh, the Indigenous communities that are within Canada. Uh, telling the federal government to implement more of the recommendations set out in the Truth and Reconciliation report that uh, um, set former Senator Murray uh, Sinclair put forward. Um, what is your stance and do you think the government has done enough to address the, uh, the report and how much it has accomplished and not accomplished? Um my point of view, I feel they've done some work, but not enough. As I've said before, I, I'm not going to, I like, I can't pinpoint exactly which ones they've, they've done really good at, or at least tried to do, but there is so many calls to actions, right? And there's so many different things that we have in the TRC, which again, anyone can Google it. It's a PDF file, if anyone's wondering. Um, it's very in-depth PDF file as well. It's a very in-depth PDF file. Yeah, it is. It is. And it, um, I mean, it might not necessarily be something that people can read in, in one sitting and that's fine, but even just taking the step to, to read it is, is a bonus in my opinion. I mean, I, I would love to see uh, more people read it. Even if people, if more people even just read a quarter of it, I would feel uh, it's going in the right direction. Right. So yeah, I, I think the government has a ways to go. Like I said, in, um, if um, I wish I knew where the where I read the report, but the report or that I read did say we are on track to have equal rights in 475 years. So to me, that's like if that's the case, if there's almost you know under 500 years left to go, to me that let, lets me realize that we are not doing that good of a job. The government is not doing a good job, um, you know, because that means that's you know at least four or five more generations to go through before. Uh, that happens. And, and I hate to say this, but um, 
in in my opinion, and I've I've spoken with other Indigenous people about this, the fact that it's so far in the future is almost like, it's just like sadly to say this, uh, the government kind of wash, wants us to die out by then so that maybe these issues don't have to be brought up anymore. And that's, again, goes back to why I continuously want to use my voice because if I can see even like one change in my lifetime, or if I can see like at least things going in the direction of change in my lifetime, um, then I feel I've accomplished what, I, what I've been wanting to do in this whole journey of, of running in politics. Um, so yeah, I think we have a long way to go and it's unfortunate, but I just, I guess my hope is that, like I said, I, hopefully I see some change or some something in the dire- the right direction in my lifetime what's change look like what does change look like to you what's the first step to change because you, we, you and i both know change does not happen overnight i think if you get oh. into politics you know that change takes about 10 years to even get on the radar of about to change so what does change look like to real lance um change to me just looks like you know like i said um all indigenous people across canada uh across turtle island as i like to say um having you know not having to fight for for the basic things like water and food and and basic healthcare, right and also uh being treated like an equal in society um there's been so many do you feel like um, you're being treated as an equal right now um, I mean, myself, I sometimes yes do, but I, again, I've got family members who like, because the problem that a lot of people need to understand with Indigenous is we are all different skin tones, right? And so I definitely don't get treated the way um, other Indigenous people do. Like my my partner, he gets profiled all the time in a lot of stores. Um, and I have a really good friend. Uh, I don't, uh, her name's Michelle Robinson. I think you've had her on before. She just got profiled the other day. Uh, I was talking to her and she was getting, she got profiled in Walmart, um, you know. So it's, upsetting because especially walmart because they are um a huge huge donor to orange shirt day they even sell all of phyllis's website books so if you ever want to get her books they're at at most of the walmarts so seeing that they are a supporter in that aspect and then seeing them profile indigenous people um is is very disheartening it almost sends a mixed message because it's like oh here we're donating to you we're honoring you on september 30th but now some of our staff are profiling your people so it's and it's not just Walmart, it's a lot of stores. And it's, I feel training needs to be done. I, I truly believe it's a training thing. Um, when uh, my partner got profiled last month, uh, it was in a store that I spent over $200 in. And I spoke to the manager and his solution was to give me a gift card. And I was like, you know, I don't want a gift card. I want this to be a training opportunity. I want you to, you know, take this seriously and have your staff trained on this. So that would be another version of change is just having more companies be trained on it and, um, you know, be more sensitive to the culture. Right. Um, and, you know, the profiling, it's, it's, and it's not just Indigenous people, it's most people of color, unfortunately, but I, it, 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 it hurts when I see it happen, because, you know, even my grandparents got profiled a lot too, in, in stores, it hurts to see that, so I guess, for me, change is just like, being able to not see that happen, and, and just being able to have these these family members of mine and and friends and stuff being able for them to feel safe in um when they're out in public right like it shouldn't be happening still in 2022 like we always like tend as Canadians people tend to like really thrive on we're not racist but like that's a really poor statement because we are (laughs) I'm gonna rip the band-aid off on that we are racist uh we like to think we're not as bad as the u.s (laughs) 
And again, like I said, when I see the when I see these people being profiled, I'm like, yeah, no, we're we're no better. And Twitter I mean, has taught I me that, Rio. T Twitter has taught me that <laughs> we are not as perfect as Canadians think they are. And I think I can burst that bubble for anyone and everyone right now that dear whatever higher power you believe in, but get your heads out of your asses, yeah. people, pardon my French, but we are not the perfect people that we think we are. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that would be... That know, would be change would for you? Change. Yeah. One of the big issues that is affecting Canadians from coast to coast to coast, and people in Calgary, Minnipur, are probably experiencing this as well because they are in uh, Calgary and they are seeing the cost of everything goes through the roof. I'm assuming you have as well. The cost of groceries is going through the roof. The cost of uh, doing day-to-day -day chores is going through the roof. The cost of gas, while it's receding, it's still higher than it was about a year ago today. Um, as an independent MP, how would you be able to address the affordability crisis within Canada? Because you are one voice, you are one vote, and I think there is a lot of concern that if we elect an independent, we may not be able to get the uh, the weight that they would hold if they had a party affiliation. So how would you be able to address this affordability issue that's happening in Canada, but also address the inflation crisis? Um, you know, again, one voice, one vote. I totally understand that fear for a lot of people. Um, again, I'm a big believer, though, that, like I said, being that that voice that's repeating things over and over again, almost like being that that thorn in the party's feet. That's kind of my goal with my voice, because I want them to listen. Um, I mean, I think, I think honestly, the the affordability of things is. Uh, I I wish that we can make things more affordable. I wish we could uh, lower costs on stuff. Uh, definitely, yes, food and gas is uh, literally outrageous. I can say that. I feel bad for the low income people. You know, even uh, the definition of what low income is. I feel the numbers too low. I think you know, low income could be technically as high as almost 100,000, in my opinion, if not a little bit higher. Uh, so maybe even um, giving more credits to what I consider is low income, so 100,000 or lower, and, and giving more um, GST credits, I guess, back to those to those families and to those those people with those incomes, um, because yeah, inflation, uh, like you said, is crazy. I I know uh, COVID probably has played a huge uh, factor in inflation. Um, you know, for me, it's crazy. I think you know, panic buying probably might have been a part of it too because I remember even before or when the pandemic was first starting and I compared those prices to now uh, you know some of those prices are like double triple four times as much depending what it is I, I mean you know and and so I just I wish that we can yeah definitely bring a lot of these prices down and um I, I understand the concept of the government trying to, I guess, make back money that it spent or money it gave to us during COVID. But I believe that, in my opinion, there's a way to do that without increasing things so fast. I th believe, I definitely believe in potentially things increasing over time, especially if we're talking like, you know, five or 10 year period or, you know, longer. But these, a lot of, the stuff like the increases and in stuff we're talking like months we're not even talking years like we're talking we're seeing increases on prices in months right and sometimes I think people have even been saying even in weeks so it's really ludicrous to me how crazy these these uh prices are so I I guess for me it would just be more um you know being that thorn in in the party's foot and and letting them know how devastating this is and and why we should be um taking it more seriously right so i don't know it's it's for me it's i i've i've utilized the food bank many times in the past so i can only imagine what it's like for a lot of people right now um and i just I would fight for those people. I would honestly, like I said, I truly believe even the definition of low income needs to be increased and we need to be helping more Canadians. Um, 
like you said, from coast to coast to coast. So I think, I think that would be some of my solutions would be just really giving back more to the people who are suffering. We, we have talked about issues that are affecting Canadians and uh, from people from all across this great country, but you were running for the people of Calgary, Minipore. And you're not yes. running for the people in Durham, Ontario, or out Nova Scotia, you're running to be the next MP for the people of Calgary, Minipore. In your conversation, since we last chatted, since you made this decision to jump from provincial to federal politics, what are the issues on the people's minds and the people's uh, uh, hearts in the riding of Calgary, Minipore when you're talking to them? Um, one of the biggest ones, which I think is not going to surprise a lot of people, is feeling that um, Ottawa tends to ignore um, Western Canada. Um, I find is that right? A lot is that true? Really? <laughs> yes. No, I'm not joking right? with that because I have talked. I've talked to many politicians across Western Canada, and they have never said that's an issue that's brought up at the door. They talk about it because it's what the narrative is, but they've never said when they're talking to people in their riding, that's what they're hearing. But you're saying it's that's what you're hearing. Yeah. So I think, but when I'm saying it's being brought up, it's not. I def, definitely I can understand why it's not something that um, every MP is talking about, but. I find I feel like they just uh, from from any from the conversations I've had anyways it's more just w wishing there was more representation in Ottawa um you know especially in in Calgary uh as weird as it I, I was even shocked to hear it too for some of it they wish there were more seats in Calgary which kind of shocked me I know that's probably not going to happen but um that's what like I said even people here in Calgary say they wish there was more seats there was more I guess more voices for Calgary. Um, they feel there's not enough voices in Alberta in general and even Western Canada. So um, do I agree with that? I mean, I part do part partially agree with, with that, but I mean, I don't know if necessarily we need more voices in Calgary because I mean, Calgary is pretty solid. It's, they all vote blue. So whoa, I Whoa, 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 Calgary if, Skyview voted red last time. <laughs> True. Okay. Yeah. But, but, you know, mostly they've been blue. Right. Um, so I think to me, I'm almost wondering is, are they saying that they want more conservatives in, in Calgary when they, when they're saying they wish there was more representation in Calgary, but, or are they actually looking to go outside of it? But I mean, uh, like you said, there was one in Skyview that went, that did go liberal um, last election. Um, but I mean, personally, I think, I honestly, I get the, the why there's so many MPs here. It's all by population, right? And I know as frustrating as it is, there's unfortunately more people out East, so they get more seats, right? Representation um, by population, my friend. Representation by yeah. population. Well, yeah. how, so. do you, how do you break through that then? Because people will say they want more representation. They want better representation in Ottawa. They want Ottawa out of our backyard and they want us to be the freest country in the world is whatever that means for some people. But how do you see yourself addressing that as the next MP for Calgary Minipore? Um, I mean, for me, I... Definitely, like I said, the fact that I'm running independent already speaks enough because I, I mean, there are other independents who run, but I think as far as I know, there's only maybe a handful who actually potentially have, you know, voice that they want to be an independent. Um, so I think for me, you know, the bonus for me, like I said, is um, I see myself as really a free agent of being an independent. I feel that there's more issues I can bring up that maybe the conservatives aren't or the liberals aren't or NDP. Um, and again, like I said, being repeating myself and being that thorn in, in the party's um, foot is, is probably key for me to getting my mess message out there. Again, being, like you said, being that one voice and that one vote is hard, but if you continuously, I guess, poke at the bear, if you will, or poke at the parties and continuously let them know what Calgary Minnipur wants. Um, you know, I, I, I believe in my heart, I truly believe in my heart that, you know, um, that they would 
listen and uh, maybe take some of the issues more seriously. <laughs> but not only that, Canada, uh, Canada, can, uh, Canada do, has voted majority governments, but I honestly believe that we probably might see another minority government. And in that situation, I feel I would really benefit because a minority government has to work with others, right? So I think I, I honestly believe we would have a minority government. I don't want to say which party I think is going to win, but I truly believe that we're. In Could you work with either government. party? Absolutely. I want to move past only sticking in with your party and only doing what your party wants to do. I, I want um, more collaboration, right? Like I know the Liberals and NDP are doing it, but I definitely will work with any party, you know, um, not just the Liberals and NDP. I'm willing to work with the Conservatives. I'm willing to work with the Greens um, and maybe even the blo the blocks, which uh, might not align with me. But yeah, definitely I'm willing to work with others and work with other parties. Um, let's start wrapping this up and because I want to ask the million, the second million dollar question, because as you know, on the show, I like to ask the million dollar questions. Um, I have tried to cover as much as I possibly can in 45 minutes. And I guarantee you there's at least one person out there yelling at their screen or telling me or writing me a nasty email for a, or for a question I posed <laughs> to you early on saying, why did you ask him this question? Why didn't you ask him this question? Well, I say this on the show all the time. It's my show and I get to ask the questions. <laughs> if you want to start your own show, go for it. But Rio, how can people reach out to you and actually ask you more questions, get involved in your campaign, learn more about yourself? How can they do that uh so again right now um we're really still using just twitter as a main platform so that's the way to reach me i'm still uh you know i i don't have a website i do have an it person but i just as an independent unfortunately i can't really put a lot of information out until elections called so again like you said we don't know when the federal election will be uh we could be 2025 or 2020X any year. Um, so Twitter is a really good way to reach out to me. Uh, I'm actually opening my email now, which is uh, riolance at gmail.com. So my first and last name at gmail.com. You got, you got, people can reach me there if they have any questions. Um, and, you know, definitely if anyone's interested in volunteering, that my email would be the best uh, place to reach me. So. And you know what I'm about to say, people who are listening and watching this. The links to Rio's information are in the show notes. So that's right. Their uh, email and their Twitter by, uh, handle is in the show notes. So scroll down. If you're driving, please pull over and then, then actually do that. But just if you want to check them out, please do. Because as we all know, democracy only happens when we have an informed electorate. Uh, Rio, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I know... Uh, it has been uh, a big change from the last time we had you on the show, but closer to the election, we will have you back on again to talk about more important issues. But this is an introduction to the people of Calgary, Minipore and who you are. So thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you for having me and have a wonderful day. Yes. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down the old Twitter and social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, keep talking.